Good afternoon and welcome to our session. First of all, we would like to thank you for your participation in our event. Before starting the event, uh, we would like to remind you that at the end of the round table, we will dedicate a time slot of around 15 minutes to answer possible questions that you might want to address to our speakers. Uh, there are two ways of participating. Either you post your question directly in the Q&A feature that you might find here on, um, on the Zoom platform, or you may raise your hand and we will allow you to participate in live mode. Now we will start the event by introducing two speakers uh, that will talk about the European strategy for the digitalization of the energy system. So we will start with the presentation of Sabine Krom. Um, Sabine is working as a policy officer in the International Energy Market Unit at the Directorate General for Energy of the European Commission. Her main assignments relate to demand side flexibility and electromobility, and she has joined the European Commission in 2000. The second one will be Rolf Riemenschneider. Uh, he is the head of sector Internet of Things at DigiConnect. Rolf is involved in the research and innovation program Horizon 2020, where he gained experience in research and innovation project management and European policies in the following areas, advanced computing, cyber physical systems, factories of the future and Internet of Things. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation, Sabine, Rolf, and now um, we will stop sharing our presentation and the screen is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, I will start. Uh, yes, hello, uh, my name is Sabine Krome. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here today at your uh, seminar. So I'm working in, in DG Energy on the ele on le electricity um, legislation and uh, regulation. So the unit, in fact, it's called internal um, energy market. So meaning within the EU, we don't deal with uh, international aspects, but we try to create a common electricity market in the among the EU uh, member states. Um, my intervention will be rather short and I apologize. I, I do not have uh, slides, but I, I guess and I hope you will be able um, to follow me um, anyway. Um, so I would like to shortly present you with a bit the uh, broader policy perspective of electromobility, not such a strong focus on the digitalization there. Maybe Rolf, he can give you more later, but more the view, well, the policy context and in particular from the electricity market um, side. Um, so um, electricity of road transport, electromobility has a major role uh, to play for decarbonization of uh, transport. So it's a clear um, policy, established uh, policy from the commission to support the development of electrification of road transport. This has been stressed in, in, in several uh, documents um, adopted by the commission over the, the past. Um, um, and then, um, of course, the electrification of road transport will have a significant impact or even one can say maybe challenging impact um, on the electricity uh, sector. It will constitute an additional uh, load, which probably from the generation side will not uh, pose a big uh, problem. But if the integration of this load in the electricity system is not managed pro properly, it could lead to congestion in the grid, probably not at transmission level, but at local level, at distribution um, network uh, level, really like close to, to your house. Um, and so if this is not managed properly, this could require costly reinforcements of, of the network, meaning you have to dig up um, the street to put in uh, new uh, cables. Um, um, so this is a, a challenge I think that is uh, to manage, um, that we need to manage and we need to look at. Um, at the same time, uh, one should however not forget that the electrification of uh, transport of this end use, uh, as we call it, can also bring uh, gains um, to the electricity um, system. Um, so the ele electrification of road transport can increase the flexibility of the system. Um, and as we know, the electricity system of the future, which uh, shall have, uh, well, which should be uh, carbon uh, neutral, it will have a lot of uh, electricity produced from renewables, which are variable in their nature. So, and, and for such an electricity system of the future, flexibility is, is uh, urgently um, needed. So 
electrification of transport can also play a role um, there and can also in this way help to increase the ability of the electricity system to absorb this new renewable energy. Um, so how do we do this? I think uh, key terms here are smart charging and uh, bi-directional charging vehicle to grid. Smart charging means that you do not charge immediately once you plugged in your car, but you react uh, the car reacts to some external signal or when it's a good moment uh, like to charge, like when for the grid it's a good moment or when there are a, good, a lot of renewables in the, in the uh, network. Um, vehicle to grid charging, uh, yeah, vehicle to grid services or bi-directional charging would mean um, if you feed a battery stored um, in the electric vehicle, in the battery of the electric vehicle back into the grid. Um, so these, I think, are, are like really two crucial points um, as regards the uh, integration into the electricity system. Um, so in 2019, um, um, there were the EU adopted several legislative uh, measures, the so-called clean energy package, and um, also with the recast electricity regulation and the recast electricity directive. And this is on the energy market side, electricity market side, an important first step uh, indeed to, to support and enable smart charging and a vehicle to grid services. It contains a number of provisions, and I will not go in detail here, that should enable such services uh, to emerge and, and to be active and offered in the market. And indeed, I think um, what we will see this probably also in the course of the day, we see that there are smart charging and vehicle to grid initiatives and projects um, emerging. Um, what we also see, however, that this is only a first step. Um, and that there are technical and regulatory barriers that remain um, to integrating cost-efficiently electromobility. Um, to, to this end, uh, the commission, so, so my DG, Director General for Energy, but together with the Director General General for Mobility and Transport, and also in cooperation with uh, DG Connect, from which we have Rolf here today. Um, we have launched a study in September 2020 to look into those technical and regulatory barriers and also in possible uh, policy uh, measures related to this to, to give us really a more comprehensive um, a picture to where yeah, what where there are still issues that might need uh, intervention, uh, regulatory intervention. Um, so the report is almost uh, finalized. Um, it will probably be finalized in, in April. Um, so in the coming weeks, and then we will also try to put it uh, on our website as quickly um, as possible. Um, so I will not give you here like the, the full conclusions of the report, but I would like to give you um, some preliminary results or a glimpse of the barriers that have been identified, which may also be of interest maybe for the, for the panel discussion um, later. So the study looks into technical barriers and regulatory barriers uh, mainly. Among the technical barriers identified was a whole set around standards and the lack of standard interoperability. Um, so here we speak about the ISO 15118, but also about other standards. Another barrier identified was the lack of deployment of smart private charging infrastructure. Uh, third one was the lack of communication standards providing real-time charging info. And for bidirectional charging, meaning feeding electricity back into the grid, uh, technical limitations of the available EV models was also identified. Um, another issue of particular important for us, of course, for the regulator are the regulatory barriers. Um, so one issue identified mainly for the bidirectional charging was the issue of double taxation, um, taxation and charges. So this might is partially looked at uh, in the ongoing revision of the energy taxation directive, but this directive only deals with excise um, uh, duty, not with other charges, but maybe um, it, or at least it's looking into, into this. Um, um, well, in, in this revision. Um, a second regulatory identified was a lack of dynamic uh, pricing schemes. Uh, as concerns this, there are some provisions on dynamic pricing schemes on and the entitlement for consumers to have a dynamic price uh, contract in the electricity directive adopted in 2019. Um, member states are currently transposing um, this directive. Um, so hopefully um, we would see some developments on, on this side here. Um, a third issue is the electricity network uh, tariff um, design. 
There are also the electricity regulation. It contains some um, provisions on um, network tariff, but it, it doesn't go uh, very far. Um, and the fourth issue identified was the lack of access to relevant information on the electric vehicle uh, battery, which is, is needed for, for third parties if they want to offer smart charging services and bidirectional charging services. Um, so this is not supposed to be an exhaustive list, but it was the barriers which were mentioned um, the most um, by stakeholders. Um, I would like like to um, stop here and um, hand you over to, to Rolf then and uh, thank you very much and I wish you a good uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sabine. Um, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, it's an honor to speak today. I'd like to share the screen. Let's see if I will find the screen. Um, do, 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 do. So you should be able to see the, the screen. Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Yes, Ralf, we can hear and see the screen. Thank you. So ex excellent. So actually, um, my name is Rolf Riemenschneider. I said from Sabine, I work in DC Connect, head of sector of Internet of Things. Um, uh, and our unit is working horizontally across different application areas, including energy, mobility, smart farming, healthy living, um, and uh, um, um, and um, healthy living and um, driving, yes. Um, so actually, um, this commission is characterized by a twin transition between um, digital and, and green. Um, the commission um, recently um, an, announced a communication on the digital decade, giving you um, a compass um, on the targets for implementation um, for society, for industry and for governance. If you look at the compass, you see um, the skills is always an issue, the need for to create new business models uh, and values, uh, uh, modernize public services and health system, and uh, in light of the the crisis, to trigger investments into infrastructures, infrastructures, connectivity, cutting edge uh, semiconductors, uh, but also data edge and cloud. Um, there's a target given about. 10,000 climate neutral, highly secure edge nodes, uh, putting more intelligence towards the, the, the end nodes, the edges and computing. So altogether, um, I think we, we're ramping up um, a digital strategy uh, and that also uh, has to go into the application areas like energy. Talking about digitization of energy, um, as I've been mentioning it, um, the, the clean energy package already, which puts much more emphasis on the consumer uh, keeping an active role in, in the energy system. And digitization within that is a challenge in itself uh, because it comes with more um, issues and problems. Um, it's a technical one, but it's not only a technical one, it's also a social one. Uh, talking about digitization of energy system, uh, we have to talk about data models. Uh, how can you share data on which standards, uh, about architectures, interoperability, uh, new business models, um, governance uh, schemes um, across the different um, components and systems we have, and the Green Deal and the targets of the Green Deal can only be de delivered across different sectors. So we also need to bring together different actors of different sectors. So said so this, um, interoperability is a key and the interoperability is uh, uh, a need to connect systems in cities and uh, different energy systems, utility systems, but also you have fragmentation of systems um, in your living, in your house, um, and everything related to the house. If you talk about interoperability, uh, we need about meet standards, technical standards, but we also need open what we call APIs, application interfaces, allowing third parties to make applications and services. You need to aggregate data across different systems. Uh, you need to 
talk about shared data, and that only could happen in partnership models where you agree across different uh, providers and vendors. And at the end of the day, you need an apps services for the, the end user, the consumer, in order to benefit from the underlying systems. Uh, digital is contributing to mobility uh, and energy efficiency and mobility market with 37% is quite a lot. But looking at uh, electrification and uh, mobility, you see already a very complex value chain. Uh, you see the car owner, you see the car manufacturer. Uh, for charging, you need a charging operator, you need a parking space um, that happens in close to your home or your living environment or within a district. And as has been explained, it's also a challenge for the grid operator to avoid peaks uh, and uh, congestion. So key value uh, for electromobility can only be delivered across the different systems, bringing different systems together. Uh, they could happen um, through more sort of to doing that in a very intelligent way. Uh, edge intelligence means that you get the best comfort for the, the end user, for the consumer, uh, to benefit from green energy, uh, to choose the best tariff. Uh, we see there's a technical challenge um, in the sense of uh, system integrations. Uh, I talked about interoperability already, uh, data integration, but also, you know, as has been mentioned, you need uh, to modernize the grid system, um, the electricity system will have a more flexibility. Uh, the seminar is about consumer, consumer-centric services and applications, uh, and this, uh, this image shows a study from Deloitte in Austria um, about the trust of, for data sharing of consumers uh, in electric mobility. And you see 37%, um, almost 30% um, trust the brand, the car manufacturer. You know, if you buy a car, the first attention goes to the the brand, the manufacturer of the car, then the government and agency, uh, later on the insurance company in order to benefit from the best tariff. Uh, and then, you know, it goes down. If you look at the cloud service providers, Amazon and the Google, only 2% trust these cloud providers. But on the other hand, I think 30, uh, 60 to 80% of these people have a, a Google account, an Amazon account and share the data um, voluntarily. So there's a bit of a contradiction. Um, over there. Uh, so this, what we're doing, what we're working on with several projects, including Interconnect, we, we try to establish um, a data sharing and governance framework. Um, what does it mean? I think we have to combine different sources for data. It's called IoT object, connected objects. You have to abstract from the data and you need sort of establish a reference framework for data access and data sharing. Um, data governance, which has to be agreed uh, in a partnership model and bilateral agreements across different vendors. And many of the stakeholders active and relevant for the actual mobility market are sitting around the table later on. Uh, and there, you know, you need this agreement, you need a, a, a trust framework, um, in particular for, for data sharing, for data services, allowing a sort of a service marketplace um, to take off. Um, and before closing, my, Quick hint on um, what we do on the Horizon Europe, the new framework program for research and innovation. Um, there's a lead publication uh, under cluster five and destination three. We actually focus on the ground, spilling the grounds for common European energy data spaces to manage flexibility of the grid, um, to have a data strategy from global data collection and to local distribution, to increase the, the integration and the share of green energy. And at the end of the day, to offer uh, plenty of services via uh, commercial services, via marketplace for data-driven and energy. For that, you know, we, we talk about European energy data spaces, which connect the grid, uh, renewable energy, the smart meter, uh, EV charging services, the parking place, um, the charging pole, um, home services, appliances, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that is basically the, the end of my talk. So you find some more links on the background information uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you, Sabine, for your presentation.
So right now we will uh, now initiate um, our session. Sorry, because you <laughs> just need to change your uh, the presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will now uh, present the case of the European project Interconnect. We will have two presentations. Uh, first one will be from David Rua, um, which is a, a senior researcher at Inesc Tech Center for Power and Energy Systems. And uh, he is currently responsible for the X Energy Management Systems area which is dedicated to the development of interoperable energy management solutions for buildings. David is also the coordinator and the project leader of Interconnect. And then as the second uh, speaker, we will have Rui Oliveira, an associate professor at the University of Minho, Portugal, and senior researcher at Inesc Tech. Actually, Rui Oliveira is also a member of the board of directors at Inesc Tech, director of the Minho Advanced Computing Center, and the appointed Portuguese expert uh, to the Euro HPC joint undertaken. Okay, so David, uh, you may go ahead with your presentation. Okay, I hope that you, you can hear me well. So um, we're now picking up the pace on the Interconnect project and doing this, this coverage also between what was the other presentation from Sabine and Wolf. You already heard about the, the services and the implementation that it's undergoing within this use case of electric mobility. So the idea is just to share a few thoughts here that we're undertaking jointly with the consortium regarding the, the project itself. So. Two theories, of course, electric, electric mobility, so is to think about electric mobility as a service. So we need to look at this as a way to support and foster um, electric mobility with a wide set of users. So to make it as universal as possible, the adoption and to use existing infrastructure and new infrastructures to actually foster electric mobility. Also, of course, to look at ways to decrease greenhouse gas emissions with the articulation of um, EVs as a flexible load within a set of other existing resources to make sure that we uh, engage the end users in making sure that they take advantage of existing, existing generation, renewable generation. And at some point to look um, and to trigger this uh, for economic viability on the side of electric mobility. So as costs are decreasing and we're seeing now, right now, uh, a more and more uh, high rate adoption of, of electric vehicles. So we need to, to take this advantage to integrate them as a practical way. So in fact, as you will see throughout this session, uh, we will see several examples from, from our uh, participants at the round table. But basically the focus is to, to put user at the, cent at the center of the discussion that involves use of technology and interoperability. So we have several challenges in this, and these challenges had to deal with electric infrastructure. So we need to find ways to integrate safely and efficiently the new resources of electric vehicles, which are flexible loads. We also need to take advantage of the use of convenient um, locations with the charging of the EVs, namely the fact that right now we have a widespread in cities car parks that are being used to or could be used to leverage this electric mobility penetration. Also, the fact that on the domestic buildings, we also should find ways to use the electric vehicle as a flexible load within other modes and other systems that exist. And also to look at the commercial tertiary buildings as a way to fulfill uh, what is the, the mandate from the Commission to decrease the carbon footprint of the buildings and contribute to their sustainability. Finally, we need to find ways of, with this, promote smart charging. And this means with smart charging that we're looking at the intelligence strategies to interoperate between systems and ensure that the user that has a charging infrastructure in their household can easily go to the commercial space and use the same charging system within the same service. So we are discussing ways of making sure not only that technology is interoperable, but also that the service is interoperable. So this is yet a challenge. But we have, of course, barriers uh, already mentioned by, by Wolf and Sabine in their intervention a while ago. And these barriers have to do with the fact that we don't have yet a democratic access to the charging infrastructure for everyone. 
We have users nowadays that don't have the charging infrastructure at their own disposition in their homes because they, they park in the public space, so they, they don't have it. So this is uh, one barrier. Another one is the fact that, as we've seen also from some intervention, that policy making has a key uh, role here, namely in ensuring that uh, the deployment of EV charging is made to ensure high quality of deployment of solutions. Also to the fact that we're looking uh, from other angles to support EVs as dynamic uh, generation systems. Um, then we have also as a barrier the, the services themselves, because we're not just discussing um, technology, we're also discussing how service can be posted back and forth, back and forth between, between buildings, between systems, and to make sure that the end user understands and can have those services readily available to them. Finally, as a barrier we have already mentioned in the previous discussion, the timing it has from the, the regulation time to the market time. So we, we can see, and for sure we'll have an opportunity to have in the round table this discussion being raised, but there's a market pull and also technology push towards the market, but then we have regulation that needs to have a bit more time to, to consolidate most of these developments in a fair way. So there's also this debate between different timing. We are looking in the project at different angles from the EV charging. So we're looking at the side of the grid of how we could use EV, EVs to support the grid operation in a more efficient way, in a more resilient way, and contribute basically as a flexible load towards the grid operation, both in a predictive and um, in a reactive way. We're also looking at ways with this to facilitate the charging. So we, we should be able to use this mobile load whenever possible at different points of the grid. So make it feasible, make it accessible to everyone and to have this vision of charging on the go. Also to make it available and usable within the infrastructure that we all have, which is homes, communes and housing in a way that we could share the existing infrastructure in services that actually foster and promote the use of existing resources to share them with, with good impacts in terms of the LCA and CC. So, at the end, we need to find also ways of looking at the business and at the retail side in making sure that we have the proper mechanisms in triggering services within um, the existing infrastructure of um, business holders and developers in the sense that other services could be tied with electric mobility. So once again, we're looking at mobility uh, as a service and other services that can be uh, clustered and added upon this, this um, EV charging as an opportunity. So if we have a car park, we, are, we have a car stop there for a certain time and we can take advantage of smart charging and other, and other strategies. So at the end, this is a good representation that we have here. This is a, a joint development that we're having in the Portuguese cluster for the Portuguese demo, which is in Sonai, where basically we're looking at this EV charging as a service in park where uh, different services besides just the charging of an electric vehicle are triggered, but other services as convenient services of having a car park are also being looked after. So interoperability has a key role here, and for sure the part of the information flows and the exchange of information between the, the systems is something that concerns us, also at the level of privacy and security, <coughs> that we will talk about in this presentation uh, in a few seconds. But basically just to kick off this discussion that as a service, there's multiple opportunities to be unlocked with electric vehicle charging. So thank you very much, and I'll pass on the floor to my colleague Rui, and we'll introduce the other points from, um, from the information side. So thank you very much. Well, good, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rui Oliveira. I'll be presenting the, the digitalization part of, of, of the project, the goals, uh, the challenges. Um, as you all know by now, the Interconnect project is all about uh, interoperability, connecting uh, many parts, uh, bringing together the, 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 the key players for in the integration of the, the full value chain. And that's why the, the Interconnect Realm is about uh, 70, uh, partners integrating 11 uh, member states. So most of this, uh, our, our daily our daily discussions is all about interconnect, interconnecting uh, uh, services, uh, APIs, but also uh, um, knowledge. Okay. So and and, and the, the main goal, in a nutshell, is to bring together in an interoperable way. 
uh, energy services, which are not interoperable uh, as of all uh, as of today, but also bring to this to this uh, uh, low value chain the non energy uh, services, which will bring us. Uh, Opportunities to 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 balance the the, the, the production and consumption of, of, of the grid, and and the way to so the, the key element to uh, for, for 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 this is to build um, uh, an interoperability framework, but this interoperability framework needs to bring semantics into the into the into the game. So. Uh, 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 we, we can we, we can say to bring the ontologies that that's the way that we uh, uh, represent uh, the semantics of, of the of the participants of the of, of the, the the players in a digital world and uh, all of this framework uh, will most probably be based on the serif principles and we, we everything should be looking at the interoperability through uh, 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 the, 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 the serif uh, reference uh, ontology. So this is the, the, the let's say, if, if, I, if, I only, if I could only show you a slide about interconnect, this would be uh, the one. Of course, from, if, if we uh, uh, go a bit, uh, uh, if we'll drill down a bit uh, the, the goals of the project, we, we still have this semantic interoperability framework as the center of everything, and then um, from let's let's say from a technological point of view, uh, most of our work will be on, on building uh, adapters uh, for uh, all the services, devices, everything that is is brought into the the the, the interoperable uh, uh, system, uh, and this uh, again will be. Uh, so uh, let's say let, let us say that Serif it's our our um, uh, uh, light tower uh, uh, in terms of development. So that not only the the technological the the the, the low level let's say uh, uh, interoperability in terms of digitalization uh, happens, but also in terms of semantics of, of bringing together things that a priori when they have been built, we're not uh, uh, taking into account the, the other. So this is, uh, I would say, one of the main challenges in, in terms of, of interoperability is, is to, to, to map uh, the semantics of, the, of services uh, that are really, really diverse. So uh, the whole thing in terms of, of, of uh, digital development uh, will be based on on on, on the on the, on the interoperability framework, and then really uh, uh, devising and, and developing uh, uh, these adapters, these connectors uh, into into the platform. Uh, this, of course, following the best practices and, and, and the best ideas in terms of marketplaces, uh, uh, service-oriented architectures, and, and so on. And this not only uh, uh, encompasses the, 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 the main partners of the, of the project, as well as also uh, intends to bring other partners in, 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 in three open calls that are, are, are planned uh, so that we can re externalize uh, uh, the ideas and have real players, service providers that can bring uh, uh, a, a value and, and, and uh, uh, a validation of the framework at the later stage. Okay? So this is what I had to, to present to you, and, and uh, most of this is, is open challenges that we still have to work on uh, a lot. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rui Oliveira. For your presentation. We will now continue our session with um, Pablo Frias as a speaker. Uh, Pablo will talk about the regulatory barriers and gaps and uh, before starting his speech let me just introduce you 
Um, Paulo, Paulo, Pablo is an associate professor at the Electrical Engineer Department, a senior researcher at the Institute for Research in, in, in Technology and director of the Observatory of Electrical Vehicles and Sustainable Mobility uh, all at Comindas University. Uh, so thank you so much for accepting um, our invitation, Pablo, and please uh, you may go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for, uh, for the, to the project for this kind of invitation. And it's really a pleasure to share with you some ideas of the regulatory challenges that uh, electromobility is currently facing. And the idea is that I will try to elaborate a bit more on the, on the previous presentations where some ideas has already been brought to the discussion. So, um, so the first thing that I am a really important thing just that I want to, to discuss with you is that certainly if we try to carry out, let's say, an adequate analysis of the regulatory barriers that e-mobility uh, faces all around Europe, we will need to go through, uh, let's say, several hundreds of individual regulations across Europe. And this is because the distribution of powers among the government bodies at the international, national, regional and even municipalities uh, levels where each one of these levels is basically empowered and compete to define a specific strategy for electromobility. And this brings a major barrier, which we would like to, uh, to try to solve in order to adequate fine tuning of all this regulation, basically top down, or we call it vertically. As an example for this, uh, basically I bring you uh, a formula where let's say uh, as a future buyer, uh, you want to buy a vehicle and you want to try to consider which are the overall costs in the lifetime of the vehicle. Here in this formula, you can see that there are let's say different costs, but on top of that, there are different taxes. And these taxes are collected by these different levels. One could be, let's say, the municipality, if we talk about parking or basically circulation that we pay every year. Uh, we have the omnipresent VAT, it's usually collected at national level, or even specific regions can define its own taxes for environmental issues. So here, there is a clear need for on a clear challenge or a clear barrier for this mobility. The second one is that this coordination that we previously defined as vertical is also move on, on, on the vertical, uh, on, an hori on a horizontal axis. And this is because uh, these, uh, the points of view in every specific level depends on many agents. And in this case of many departments, we all know that from an environmental and health point of view, electromobility has been pushed. However, if we are, for instance, in a, in a municipality where we have, let's say, local car manufacturing of, let's say, traditional uh, cars, maybe this pushing into electromobility will have a negative effect on traditional manufacturing. So we may have a reduction in the, in the in, let's say, in the employment or in the, on, or in the industry in the area. But on top of that, if for promoting this electromobility, we are reducing the taxes on some specific or this specific type of sustainable mobility, then the tax collection also will be reduced. Although these, all these levels should be uh, ruled usually by a single party, which is usually not, uh, not always the case, the information and the decision-making within these departments is not always as fluent as we ought to like. So here we face, let's say, like a second big administrative barrier that we always need to, uh, to work. So if we go down a bit more on the, let's say, on more tangible, uh, let's say, barriers that, let's say, electromobility is facing, the first thing, and this is something that has been already, of, already discussed, is, is uh, mobility as a service. So it's, it's very important that although the discussion of electromobility is usually focused on the private car ownership, it is not this, it is about I mean, it is not about changing all electric vehicles into, sorry, all combustion-based vehicles into electric vehicles. That's not the way. I mean, when we talk about uh, sustainable mobility, 
we should first pay attention to accessibility and efficiency. And the focus should be on public transportation, which is efficient and it is very easy to, to electrify. We also need to talk about car sharing, which is also really a nice way of improving the efficiency. And here I bring you some, uh, some example that we recently have, I would say recently in the last five years in, in, in Madrid, where uh, since uh, it was like four or five years ago, we, we have to really focus on, on let's say, electro sharing, uh, both on cars, uh, motorcycles, scooters, bicycles, anything you can imagine. And, and we do so, and, and we all, I mean, and all the other people have the opportunity to move whatever they want in the more efficient way they want. However, this is not like this. I mean, it is not just like leaving all these tools to the people. I mean, we need to make an order of these. I mean, so we need to prioritize the use of them. We need to define and to design infrastructures and decision-making rules for all these things to be together and not to compete, but to live together in a city. In, if, you, if we don't do so, basically we make the system, let's say less secure and of course less efficient. Okay. And a final thing also very important from a general point of view is the environmental awareness. This is something that we, uh, from, from a social point of view, I think and in, in the next uh, presentation, they will focus on this, but it's, I think it's really important that we will need to work on this. Although there is a difference between the price and, 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 the, and the risk we assume when we go through electromobility, there is a social need to move from that. As we do from, for, uh, for renewable generation, we should go also for sustainable uh, mobility, which is electric mobility and which also is more secure mobility. So, um, Basically, when, when, I mean, if we think in an economic way of uh, the future buyer of a vehicle, and we need to decide which technology we should choose, basically the first barrier we face is, is, is the purchase cost. That's something that, I mean, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but you know, we see in the previous, in the previous slides that there is a, the, the, the different administration, they have a powerful tool to modify the taxes in order to make this difference we usually it's among 20 to 70% of the price compared with a traditional combustion engine. This is the difference for that. Uh, the second thing it's in the, during the use of the, of the car, it is also very important, the electricity cost. This electricity cost has different components and within these components, we can face that in some situations, the costs are higher than expected. And these are higher than expected because of two main reasons. The first one is what we call the network cost. And that's something that you can see in the picture above where you can see the sharing of uh, the fixed cost and the energy cost among the different countries. And you can see that these cost in some cases is very high. And this means that you can face a challenge when you want to install, for instance, charging pole, or for, uh, as we'll see later, for, uh, for an aggregator to design this charging system. The second thing is that usually in the euros per kilowatt hour that we pay for the electric consumption, usually there are like say several, uh, what we call policy costs, which are not energy, it's other things that we include there, which can be renewables, which can be any other thing. And usually this policy cost sometimes it's not directly related with, with uh, the provision of sustainable mobility. Because the thing is that as we are sustainable, we are promoting sustainability, that so this policy cost should not be so high or even should be eliminated. For. And something last, something that already uh, my colleague uh, mentioned, Sabine, is the double charging when we talk about V2G, because you know the system is basically designed for loads and not generators distributed along the network. So if we want to do two things at the same time, we can face this, uh, this double charging that may really reduce or, or let's say make a barrier for us to be as a V2G system. Next, um, I think uh, the other really important thing 
uh, when we move to the, uh, let's say, not to the demand side, but the supply side, basically, uh, Rui already introduced a slide where you have, let's say, all the big ecosystem that really electromobility brings, which is, let's say, the IT providers, we have the car manufacturers, we have many things. But anyway, I will focus here in the one of the challenges that we are currently facing, which is the, the, the charging infrastructure of, uh, of, the, of the vehicles, which basically, as you know, can be divided basically in private charging, which is house charging and public charging. So if we think about the private charging, I think the critical thing, and that's something that has been anticipated, and I think it's, it's a big core of this interconnect project, is the lack of incentives for uh, smart charging and flexibility. And that's really critical. That's something that we still was not, weren't able to solve with the integration of distributed generation, but currently we are still facing. So the thing is that currently, the, as we are not being, uh, let's say, aware to participate in flexibility, the technical regulation for us to connect into, or for electric vehicles to connect into the system are quite conservative. That means that I will pay more for the charging system and for the reinforcement that I will provoke into the system and the network itself will be more expensive. So this cost reduction that could happen if we, let's say, do it smartly um, is completely lost and couldn't be, this benefit couldn't be shared among the users and therefore could reduce the, 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 pay, the payment that they need to make. That's, that's a, a very important thing. And the second important thing that nowadays is still happening is that um, is the metering thing. So basically, in many cases, basically, what I mean, if you want to install a charging pole for your own, you need to install a different meter. You cannot do it, let's say, downstream or connected to the previous one. Uh, that's a problem because at the end you will pay twice the fixed amount because you need to pay for the two meters. And that's something that, you know, that's, that's a barrier that still exists in, in, in some specific regulations. So to conclude, um, from now from the private charging, let's focus on the, on the public charging, which I think it's, it's some, let's say, really barrier for really a, a, the explosion of uh, electric vehicles. Uh, of course, I mean, currently the companies that or the promoters that we have on, on, on this uh, kind of public charging infrastructures are basically the energy companies or the petrol companies or some specific car manufacturers. That's it. Nothing has really happened in, 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 in a big format for independent uh, charging providers. And that's a pity. And, that, and why this is not happening? And that, I, I will try to focus on this. So basically, the first challenge is that uh, they face really high charges for the charging points. That's what we say previously. One, because uh, this is uh, what we call the chicken and the egg problem. It's a high charge, but you have a huge uncertainty of how many cars will come in the, in the, in the next, uh, let's say, months or even years. So the, uh, how you will pay this big amount, it's, it's really tough. Uh, this clearly limits small companies really to increase its penetration in, in smart charging. The second challenge is basically um, that if they want to participate as, uh, to sell ele electricity, they need to, to become a retailer. And, and you know, the thing behind that is uh, you need to, receive, to register as a market agent uh, you need to have economic guarantees for that. And there are like many other requirements, which has been done, let's say, for the big utilities, for, for the big retailers. And of course, if you are a small, let's say you want to develop a small business or charging, that will be really a challenge for you because you will not be able to comply with all of them. Okay. And moreover, currently the role of aggregators and, and local markets uh, is still not clearly settled in our countries, although we have been working for, let's say, quite a couple of decades, working on how integrated, uh, how integrate efficiently distributed generation, the mindset management, so on and so forth. But so far, this is something uh, a work in progress for for many countries. Okay, and finally, um, I mean, although the technical standardization has been more or less settled in in Europe, as Sabine mentioned and, and Rolf also did. 
uh, the interoperability among the public charging infrastructures now is not really working as a service. And that's something which is really a pity because imagine that you, you could only refuel your, your car in a specific brand of gas stations. And that's really a challenge. How to integrate these, uh, let's say, public charging infrastructures that they belong to different energy companies that sometimes they compete, so they offer different services in each one, but they don't allow to participate in, in, uh, among each other. So uh, that was it. So, so basically to sum up, uh, although we are, let's say, at the initial stage of the transition to electromobility, I think it's, I mean, there's a huge potential in it to be unlocked. And that's something that uh, has already been presented. And I think it's part of the study of this interconnect project. So I think the, the first focus that the policymakers should be working on is to do it in a smartly way and they should be proactive. I mean, they shouldn't wait until things happen. They should react previously. And that's something that we have learned a lot from the distributed generation integration for demand side management. So we need to incorporate all these together and let's say take profit of it. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. Now we will present uh, the next speaker. So Uh, the next the next presentation will be on social and technical barriers and it will be done by Lucia uh, Rakosevich. Lucia is an R&D manager at the Belgium Innovation and Research SME Thinky where she works on creating enabling framework for implementation of innovative technologies needed for successful energy transition. She has more uh, than 10 years experience in the energy sector, in public and private sectors, as well uh, as in scientific research. And she is a physicist and computer engineering with, uh, with a PhD in electrical engineering. So thank you so much, uh, Lucia, for accepting our, um, our invitation and please go ahead. Thank you for inviting me and uh, let me start the presentation. I will try to be quick. Uh, I realize uh, we might be a little bit behind time. Um, okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'll be talking about social and technical barriers to mobility, mainly from the point of view of integration of electric mobility with the digitized energy system. And, um, from our experience, this is, these are, let's say, some of the barriers that we've seen from our experience. And I'll go at the end, maybe towards some solutions, but it's mainly what I'm hoping we'll be discussing in the panel session, uh, which is coming. So what are the technical barriers? Technology for electric vehicles is not new. We've had electric vehicles uh, in the second half of the 19th century, although things have changed in the meantime. Uh, but also integration to the grid, to the electric grid, uh, the technology for this already exists, um, although maybe not with the, all the details that we're, we need today. And from the aspect of the consumer uh, uh, involvement, what we know is that clear communication and clear business case are the most important. So what are actually these main barriers that we see today from our point of view? Uh, I will discuss three main barriers, and the first one is, as we've heard, I think multiple multiple times already today, is um, let's say lack of open communication standards and interoperability between devices, but also non-proprietary standards. And there, when we go from <laughs> what has I guess changed from the 19th centuries, now we have electronics, which create uh, let's say some of these solutions, but also some of the issues that we're seeing today. And that's when you want to charge your vehicle, you have communication between your vehicle and the charger, but also between the charger, energy management system, or the charge point operator, or the charger and the grid, or energy management system and the grid. And there we need um, use of open communication standards that 
as I said, are not proprietary. And I mentioned some of them here. And while some of them, and you can say, okay, some of these standards are already exist, some of them we're working on and that will be implemented soon. And this is one of the aspects of, let's say, the barrier, and that's the timing of these standards. So we have to understand that not just developing standards, but also testing them and implementing them is needed for a wider implementation of electric mobility or their integration with the, uh, with the grid. The second one that I want to discuss a bit more detail is power system integration. And I said already, okay, the, the technology exists, so that's true. But for the wider uptake, there is still some challenges that, that we need to face. And one of those challenges is understanding that one charger, which is about 22 kilowatts, is about equal to, let's say, seven to eight houses, average houses today. Uh, and connecting those chargers to the low voltage network, we need to understand the capacity or the ability of low vo voltage network to take that. And there we uh, put a focus on the smartness and the visibility of low voltage network beyond the substation and what, how much can we see the, let's say the congestions in real time and what is happening on the low voltage grid. And that brings us to the uh, flexibility markets uh, on the low voltage level or on the distribution level which is the regulatory aspect and has been mentioned already, but also while we talk about uh, el electric vehicles being a flexibility asset, we need to understand, as is mentioned also, uh, sometimes that electric vehicles are storage on wheels, that we have to understand what that means, that, is that the storage moves around and it's connected with a higher capacity at different locations at the different times. And in current situation, this create this is just complex and costly for the DSOs. And that's why a lot of people are moving towards behind the meter solutions, which are good, but there is different, let's say, use cases and ways how this is going to progress if we're pushing everything behind the meter. But then on the other hand, also saying that electric vehicles are bringing flexibility or improving smartness of the grid. And then final technical barrier that also in a way switches towards social barrier is some aspect of let's say this whole uh, system of, of electric vehicles and the charging and the batteries that uh, are, might be very relevant in one certain moment, but then across uh, over time as the technology develops, they don't, they're not technically any more relevant, but they become a social barrier because other stakeholders that are not so involved are still as a barrier to accessing this market. And there I would like to talk about, for example, EV uh, models that are being available today. Uh, of course, uh, V2G models are not so much available, but the market for V2G is also not so high. So we expect that this will go as the market develops. And the, the timing of this also with the standards needs to be uh, followed and somehow, uh, let's say, harmonized. Then we also have to understand that there is energy loss in, for example, energy that we're fitting into our EV battery and energy that we're taking out due to the changes from AC to DC and back. And then finally, the battery degradation that has been discussed a lot, but some cases people understand that battery degradation is due to using your electric vehicle as an energy service uh, or flexibility uh, device, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. It depends how you use your battery. Battery degradation is very complex. It needs to be better understood. And that brings me sort of to social barriers where we have this one of the main social barriers is lack of up-to-date information and knowledge of all the stakeholders that are there. And we need, to, um, we need to approach this very systematically from the EU level, but also from the national level. We need to provide information to not just consumers, but also to banks and investors, to insurance companies, to administrators and regulators, but also to car service, um, let's say for maintenance of the, of the vehicles, how is this whole ecosystem of electric mobility going to look like? Then we switch to, uh, let's say, complex communication on this topic. And uh, of course, some of us that are in this field, it seems like, okay, we're already maybe talking about this in very simple uh, uh, aspects. And that's not, that's not the point. The point is that I'm a user and I have other problems in my life and other things that I'm dealing with. I need to, this technology needs to be put very simple, both technology, but also principles. And then finally, what are my benefits? If I'm going to do this, if I'm going to change from my static phone to my smartphone, 
what's the point? Why would I do this? And what, what do I get from this? And who are the minimal, let's say, points of contact that I have to, uh, to talk to, to, to get into that? And this would definitely allow new, uh, newcomers to get into the field and understand where is their place. And this is one of the reasons, because we've had such a complex communication and stakeholders have had a challenge to understand this, this is one of the reasons why a lot of players in this field are preferring uh, business to business models instead of business to consumer. And that uh, finally <laughs> sort of brings me to the aspect of the user because users are skeptical. Of course, they're skeptical. When you look at from the point of view of the energy sector, you say, okay, I have all these houses with all these devices that are flexible. And if I optimize everything, as, for example, in an energy community, if I optimize everything together, then it's going to be, uh, then I'm going to get something that's that's better than what I have today. However, we have to understand that for all those 100 devices, there could be 50 users. And every one of those users have to give up certain control over that device that they bought for transport, which is in this case, electric vehicle. And that brings us to their, of course, range anxiety because they want to use this for transport, not just for energy services, that just in addition to their transport use, but also they have they want to make sure that it's safe, that from, from the point of view of data security, but also from the point of view of what happens if during this energy service, something happens to my car, who is responsible? Is the company that's using my electric vehicle for other things, or is it my uh, car manufacturer? And there is no currently clear benefits to the user why they would go through all this trouble to allow their electric vehicle to be used or switch uh, to electric vehicle. And that finally brings me to the business model, which was mentioned a couple of times, but we have to understand that electric vehicle is a transport tool, but it could also be an electricity, electricity storage or part in the electricity system. As, as transport tool, it brings air pollution benefits, but then also brings me a question of, can I charge easily? Can I travel easily through EU? Um, should I switch from what I'm using today? Do I get like, is it easier for me? Is it cheaper for me? And then when we go to the electricity storage and we say, okay, but you can also use this transport tool, which you cannot do with your car today as an electricity service, then we say, okay, it brings flexibility, but are flexibility markets ready for this? Um, we say, okay, even if you go behind the meter and you don't need flexibility market on the DSO level, then you can take advantage of dynamic pricing. And is the is there a dynamic price that I can take advantage of? Is there a time of use price in the country that I'm living with in? And then finally, are energy tariffs and taxation set up so that they actually encourage me to do this? Uh, these are just some of the questions that the user is asking and we need to give very clear answers and we need to, uh, let's say, simplify the conversation but stay accurate and not promise what we cannot deliver. Um, as Tinky, we were involved in different projects on the, on the national level but also on the EU level sort of creating this enabling framework and I would like to uh, sort of give attention to these two publications where uh, the the one the booklet on on for smart cities information system is more for let's say wider audiences explaining electric mobility and then uh, the second one is has already been mentioned by Sabine at the beginning uh, which is not yet public on the regulatory solutions on how to integrate electric vehicles into the uh, the grid and thank you for your time. And I hope I didn't take too much time. And I hope we'll see some of the answers to these questions in the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Lucia, for your presentation. We will now. Yes. You can hear us, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. We will now. Uh, start with um, with the round table. So first of all, we will present our moderator. Which is Luis Seca. So now we will have this round table dedicated to the opportunities and barriers for EV charging. Uh, Luis Seca is a senior researcher 
in the power energy systems and also um, uh, the executive uh, belongs to the executive board uh, of Inesctec. His current research interests are focused on the integration of distributed energy resources, renewable EV and storage um, in distribution systems, dynamic stability in isolated systems, smart grids and energy efficiency. So Luis, thank you very much for accepting the challenge to moderate this discussion. And um, the word is, is yours. Very much, Joanna. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome once again to our event on the digitalization of the user centric energy system, the use case of electric mobility. Uh, so, now we will have a round table where we will discuss one of the topics that is being addressed at uh, Interconnect that is related with the opportunities and barriers uh, for EV charging. For this discussion, uh, I have a panel of eight experts that come from different areas, as you will see from the value chain in the electrical sector, that will give us their perspective uh, on this topic. So now for the audience, I will present each one of them very briefly. So we have Annika Arumait. She's a business development manager at Kio. Uh, she has a master's degree in renewable energy management and at the Interconnect project, she is responsible for the conceptualization, communication and all organization activities related to the German pilot, residential and hotel. Uh, next, and next to me, I have uh, my colleague Clara Bovea. She is a member from the Center for Power and Energy Systems of, of Finnish Tech. Uh, she leads a, a very important area that is EMS, CMS, and network automation. She received a PhD degree from the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Porto. With us also, Josef Baumeister. He works at BSH Home uh, Appliances since 2011, where he is responsible for smart home and smart appliances standardization. From 2016 until November 2020, Josef was the managing director of eBus Initiative. Is an electrical engineer, member in smart home and grid standardization bodies such as IEC, Senelec, and DTA. Jose Fortunato is a member of the board of directors of Sonai Mobility Continent. He holds a degree in economics from the University of Porto and an MBA from ICA Fontainebleau. Jose is, a Son is in Sonai since 1999. At Sonai, he has participated in several projects such as Universal Car, Continent Online, Retail, and Environmental Sustainability. Also with us, Manuel Galvez. He works in the European Affairs at LIA Group, active in electricity transmission, and includes two TSOs. Manuel is with LIA Group since 2011, having worked at different positions in innovation, strategy, and external relations. Manuel holds an electromechanical engineer diploma from the University of Piura in Peru, and then he holds a PhD for applied sciences from the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, Michel Keller from Volkswagen Group. He's responsible for the coordination of charging topic within the core area of standards, association, associations, and politics. He has more than 20 years' experience in the automotive industry and suppliers with OEMs. Before he joined Volkswagen in 2010, as head of energy systems and functions development, he was heading the traction with battery technology and battery development at Taiwan, Taiwan in Continental. Uh, Robin Roos, he is representing consumer interests in the mobility sector and engaging them in the green transition. His main focus is on the emissions from cars, the charging infrastructure, access to data, and the information to consumers when choosing their mode of transport. Before joining the EUC, Robin worked as advisor in the Belgian Federal Parliament and in Brussels-based consultancy building expertise in mobility topics. And also with us, again, it's a pleasure to have Rolf Schneider, and he's the head of the sector in the uh, Internet of Things at DG Connect. Uh, he has been involved in the research and innovation program Horizon 2020, as you have seen, where he gained significant experience in research and innovation project management and European policies in the areas of advanced computing, cyber physical systems, factories of the future, and the Internet of Things. 
So thank you all for being present. Um, just to have a very brief introduction. So um, we have been talking about end users in this uh, digital transformation as something that involves creating a whole new perception uh, of the electrical energy. Uh, and as we know, the majority of consumers lacks awareness on its value. Um, so there seems to be an opportunity uh, with electric mobility as people will tend to make this direct comparison between the cost of kilowatt hour and the cost per liter of fuel. Uh, so giving them a clear idea of how electricity can be competitive when compared to other sources of energy. There is, however, the problem of fighting range anxiety, and we've seen this in the, in the previous presentations, and also the availability of the infrastructure that will foster these alternative business models that explore this need of being wired whenever possible. And so as something very interesting to, to reduce costs. Um, and picking this point, I will probably start with Manuel and I will ask him, um, Manuel, probably the most asked question uh, we have every time we talk about electric mobility, uh, why is this relevant for, for a TSO that has this high voltage uh, infrastructure? How, how are grid operators preparing to support this forcing increase in, in the number of EVs? Hello, uh, Manuel Galgis here. Uh, many thanks for the question and many thanks for the invitation. Indeed, in order to, uh, to understand why EVs can be of interest for a TSO, we need to look beyond only the connection to the grid and the situation of today. I think in the beginning, uh, it was clear that the road to decarbonization will mean not only increasing the carbonization of electricity supply, but also the carbonizing and using sectors. And so in this panorama of more renewables variable in the electricity mix, as well as uh, less share of thermal plants, we need to do something to balance the future grid. And so this means that we need to tap more and more into the flexibility of end users and meanings end user, not only industry, but also uh, end consumers, so households, commercial buildings, etc. And so uh, when we look at that under that premise, uh, we started to look what are the interesting technologies that are uh, almost close to market or, or are ramping up in the market adoption. And so electricity, uh, electromobility, COT or I, uh, and what we did last year was to look at what could be the impact, for instance, of uh, 1.5 million of electrical vehicles in Belgium and 10 million of electrical vehicles in Germany at the rise of 2030. Uh, we, we simulated uh, different scenarios of more charging, uh, combining uh, normal charging and bidirectional charging, and the results were really interesting. If we do nothing, meaning if we stay uh, and, and, the, and the charging is, is done uh, normally at the end of the day uh, and everybody starts to charge almost at the same time, uh, their result at system level is um, more or less an, an augmentation of 8 to 10 percent of the peak power demand. And uh, this perhaps couldn't be uh, huge for some countries. I think for countries like Belgium will be, uh, in particular because this uh, power demand will appear at times when there is few wind or few sun. And so you will have to use other means such as uh, thermal plants to cover that demand. However, we can uh, see also that uh, through smart charging, you can convert these challenges into opportunities. And these opportunities will be shared among uh, different players. On the one hand, uh, these opportunities can be monetized by uh, end consumers uh, that we'll see, uh, for instance, in the XT bill uh, in, with a given reduction in price. But you can also monetize it and, and have it at system level, uh, in particular, for instance, as a TSO, in terms of reduction of CO2 emissions, in terms of additional uh, renewables that you can integrate into the market and by the way also in terms of uh, reduced uh, uh, operational cost to uh, to operate the, the future power system and so this is relevant as a TSO because you have a triple role we have to balance the grid and in real time you have to also make sure that the future grid that they put in place enables not only more renewables but also more electrification and uh, last but not least we are also market facilitator and so when we look at all these points we also see that in order to make sure that the EVs bring maximum value for society in the shorter term, we need three enables. So we try to look at the a, a glass half full instead of half empty. And so these enables are the ones that you see in the infographics. So first of all, we need to uh, accelerate the deployment of physical and digital infrastructure. So the essential in order to accelerate the uptake is that the consumer sees 
the infrastructure both at public and private places. And this should be a smart charging infrastructure. And I think that we need to do it in order to accompany the uh, different waves of electrification. So we see now the first wave that is the wave of passenger cars and commercial fleets vehicles, but we also need to look also in the next few years where the second wave will come and that would be mainly from our perspective, the wave of uh, heavy duty vehicles. So we need to be prepared for that and to need for that needed this uh, smart charging infrastructure both at private and public places. In order to support this private, uh, this physical infrastructure, we also need digital infrastructure. It means that you need to be able to meter, you need to be able to communicate. So uh, deployment of smart meters in some countries is lagging behind. So we need to push uh, in these countries and we need also to push for these users that are uh, installing PV panels or active loads such as the electrical vehicles. Complementary to that, we also need to uh, have a lean uh, communication layer that helps uh, transferring this information, a sort of a rotor from a point to another point, uh, and on top of that, uh, commercial, uh, commercial services can be built. So uh, again, the second point is open access to data, uh, being mindful of uh, consumer uh, rights. That means that we need to first be able to ensure that the consumers get access to their data. That's, that's a, a right by itself in an easy way and can uh, easily uh, uh, make sure that this data is accessed by third parties, uh, market players that are using this data in order to develop services and get compensated by this sharing of data through, for instance, better and more competitive energy services. Uh, on the same side, uh, system operators, so PSOs and DSOs, I think we need access to data to, in order to uh, make sure that we can uh, manage our, the, our regulated task uh, of developing the grid and we need to update our scenarios to, to, for re grid reinforcements. We need to update also our scenarios in order to better manage uh, and, and uh, the outages in our system, and also uh, better forecasting of the balancing uh, and, the, and, the, and the EV charging in order to uh, balance the grid in the real time operations. And last but not least, I think also as, as other uh, colleagues in the, in, the, in the chat has been presenting, we need also to adapt the market rules. Uh, so the market rules mean that today the market is mainly catered to big players, to big uh, uh, also uh, um, uh, generations, uh, but the world is changing. Uh, we're going to a more decentralization, more viable generation, more active consumers. So we need to make sure that these market rules uh, allow uh, to, to, to make the most of the flexibility of, uh, of, of EVs for the different markets. And in the end, I think that this is a, a good thing because the benefits of the flexibility will be spread along the value chain. Thank you, Manuel. So a very, efficiency, a very efficient start. Uh, you raised several questions that well went well beyond the, the, the perspective of, of the TSO. Um, but you did raise some, some that will take me to the second question that I will make to, to Clara. Um, that is about the planning and, and operation of the electrical system of the future. So we, are, we have all seen uh, the, the, the plans and the effects of this massive integration of this uh, variable uh, renewable-based generation that, as you know, is often distributed all over the network. All of a sudden, you have EVs that also appear everywhere. And so a lot of people is concerned about how we will be able to manage the network with all these variability associated. I know that you have some very interesting ideas <laughs> that transform a problem for some, that is the electric vehicles into an opportunity. How do you think that this storage on wheels can help us managing this smart I wish, hi everyone. It's very nice to be here, exactly in the Smart Grid and UV laboratory from, from Inesk, where the main objective was exactly to exploit this idea of how we can um, exploit the flexibility from, from EV charging to support the, the network. And before going there, it, I would like also to, to highlight the, um, the heat maps shown by Pablo that were actually also part of our work. And the first step is really to understand what could be the impact at the distribution and at the transmission level. And through our studies, we concluded that actually this will change the, the power profiles along the entire system. And so we need to adopt this, this smart charging strategies. 
Um, and in fact, the EV can be regarded as this mobile storage on wheels that uh, can be exploited from the building um, to the, the transmission system level. And at the building, um, by, by modulating the EV charging and adapting its power along the time, we can maximize the use of renewable energy uh, because it uh, doesn't make sense to consider electric mobility without uh, a, a really increase of, of the renewable energy system integration. But on the other hand, being a storage device, it, it actually can change very quickly its power output, um, either by reducing or even injecting, injecting in the grid. And from this perspective, we could even think on, on this uh, frequency support uh, services that are particularly interesting for the microgrids, for, for improving the resilience of a system that will be uh, increasingly dominated by, by renewable energy. And so we have the possibility of this frequency and very um, uh, rapid and demanding services, but also to support voltage, to support congestion at the distribution and at the, the transmission. And again, helping to, to those smaller energy systems, such as the building, the energy communities and the microgrids to maximize its self-consumption and the integration of renewable energy. Thank you very much, Clara. You did mention that the car itself will have a tremendous impact. And, and if talking about cars, I need to talk with Michel from Volkswagen. Um, we, we have seen in, in Volkswagen Power Day event uh, an, impression, an impressive ambition from, from your side. Uh, including at the infrastructure level. Um, I had two topics that grabbed my attention that I would like to, to somehow discuss with you today. Uh, one of them is that starting in 2022, all the vehicles built on Volkswagen modular MEV electric vehicle platform will support bidirectional or two-way charging. And it was mentioned that this will allow green electricity from the solar energy system to be stored in the vehicle and feedback into the home network if needed. So somehow Clara did mention something about that, although reducing charge, but also the capability to, to, to provide this power back to the grid. Uh, and it was also said that Volkswagen plans to offer a range of products to enable this, including a home energy storage system and a mobile EV charger that is unconnected from the grid. This will enable car owners to become their own utility. Um, how how does, does Volkswagen see this, this involvement with, with end users and its integration in the electrical energy system? If, if we have other, and as you see, we have other service providers from retail and aggregation and others, that are proposing some management solutions, how can we assure that your car uh, solutions will interact with the existing ecosystem? Yeah, thank you for introduction and, uh, and, and for this uh, question. And uh, yeah, it was very, uh, uh, tremendous effect in, in the in the whole market, what uh, Volkswagen did uh, present on, on, the, on the Power Day. Um, and uh, this is really a clear inside view on, on what uh, Volkswagen is doing strategically. And uh, you, can, you can see all under, under the aspect of um, making the mobility um, CO2 neutral. So that's, that's the key for, for all these uh, activities. And, and therefore, it is, uh, it is absolutely necessary that uh, we take care that there is uh, the ability um, that the energy which is charged in the, in the battery of the vehicle, or maybe also two times used with bidirectional um, um, energy flow, um, so that we maximize the use of uh, renewable electricity and also use this electricity for the new mobility. Um, yeah, what did you, you asked uh, what uh, Volkswagen uh, is, is doing on that. So, so we have several partnerships uh, to, to support this strategy. And also we have founded uh, uh, our, our um, Ali um, company. So Ali company is, is doing the um, energy um, uh, distribution uh, in, in, in Europe and giving uh, 
CO2 neutral co electricity contract to our uh, customers. And uh, by that, they are also doing um, uh, products like uh, the, the, uh, the wall box, uh, but also we do further um, products which will support the, the energy flow in both directions by uh, having such products connect to the current and to the grid or at least to the home and to the home energy management system is also um, um, the, the upcoming products which we will uh, support. Um, to, your, to your second uh, question, so how this management solution shall, shall work together with the existing ecosystem? Um, so this question has to be answered on, on different levels um, because uh, on one part, we, if you are just talking about the connection and that was previously already uh, been, been shown, um, we need interoperable and, and, and clear standards. And uh, for us, it's, it's no doubt. And uh, this is also something uh, what we are, uh, see in, in, for, the, for the whole market that the um, communication between the car and the infrastructure has to be on one single and clear standard, which is the ISO 1511.8 standard, which has also been uh, referred to uh, in, in, in previous um, uh, speeches. Um, and also the next level, how to integrate such um, um, a charger from, from home to the home energy management system. So this is, for example, then uh, best what we can do and which is already existing, the EEBUS uh, standard. Um, but this is only one, or well, that's a two parts of the whole chain and that chain has to be uh, extended. Um, also to the whole um, energy flow, um, but also on the dig digital side. So then we need um, a clear uh, direction where all the communication has to go through and, and how this data is being interacting by the different players in the market. Because not only one provider can do the whole chain, so they have to be, have a, a market where several provider uh, are working together and taking care that the energy flow are on one side controlled by the direction of where the renewable and at what time the renewable are existing and shall be used and shall be maybe also stored for, for later usage in the grid again. And on the other side where the grid is capable of uh, feeding such energy through to the uh, cars or to um, uh, stationary batteries or whatever is uh, then as a flexible load being, being available. And that is a very important aspect where we have seen today uh, there are still some open question marks, but as, as clear and earlier, we have a clear definition of the standards as better this can uh, be solved and uh, the different players can be interacting. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Uh, so now we have, let's say, a view uh, from the, the, the capacity and, and the, 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 the management of the infrastructure and also from the electric vehicle itself and its capability. I would now like to explore something a little different, uh, more related with, with alternative uh, business models. So I will now pass the word to, to, to Jose. Um, Jose, for a company uh, like Sonai that has a focus on, on retail and, and distribution, uh, how did this evolution in the transport, in the transport sector suddenly became uh, an opportunity? What are the main challenges in this new business model you are creating and how do you think your customers will respond? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this invitation for, to be present in such an interesting discussion. So AMC, as, as you just said, is focused on food retail. It's our, our main, main core business, food, food retail. We are, or at least we try to be, a customer-centric company. And so we are we invest a lot of time and effort studying, um, trying to develop the best uh, customer experience, either it be physical or digital, uh, we can deliver to our customers. We study a lot of, of customer journeys, and usually it starts at customer home. Uh, it starts when they when they see our leaflet and when, when they watch our TV ads or watch our promotion, see our promotion on, on the app. Then usually they come to our stores by car, and the, show, the experience we can we can offer our customers uh, even before they get into the, our store is very important. 
in our vision, EV users will, will tend to take any opportunity to charge their, their vehicles while parked. Uh, if, if the price is, is, is competitive, for sure, uh, if in energy is low, low carbon or ideally carbon free. And uh, we believe the, this, this poses a, a great opportunity for, for us in order to, to get a better shopping experience for, for all our customers. Complementary, uh, as you might know, uh, Sonai Group uh, signed Paris Agreement Pledge, but decided to anticipate uh, its carbon neutrality in 10 years. Uh, carbon neutrality target in 10 years. It's a very ambitious target. It forced us to, to, to rethink from scratch our organizations, uh, which we did following uh, science-based target methodology. We signed a roadmap and basically with two different axes. Real estate and mobility. Uh, regarding mobility, I can share some, some initiatives, some projects. For, uh, for instance, we, we launched the Flex It Up back in 2019, a program that allowed our people to work remotely. <laughs> it was it was a luck for us because when COVID uh, uh, started, we had some experience. Then we are promoting training in uh, eco driving. We have created specific parking lots for bicycles in order to promote a healthy and discarbonized work commute. And it's in all these contexts that we launched um, to, uh, to, to our customers electric mobility through an efficient impact service that we call continued plug and charge. Given the capability of Sun IMC uh, all over Portugal, uh, typically we have large parking areas in our stores. We believe that we can have a role fostering electric mobility in, in all country. And um, I think this is an opportunity for us, but of course there are huge challenges and very different levels of challenge. There's regulatory ones, for sure, and we have talked about it just before this uh, round table. Mobility needs, carbon neutrality targets, customer acceptance, for sure, and very important, among others. Within mobility needs, we have considered our internal fleet, our, our people, our clients, last mile delivery services, Heavy logistics, they all have very different characteristics and, 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 and they offer us quite different challenges for the upcoming years. Our ambitious carbon neutrality targets um, made us decide to go for a zero emission uh, mobility solution. It made us start a vast program of the installation of renewable generation in our stores um, and, and buildings and made us uh, close a deal, a power proposal agreement for acquisition of an energy 100% renewable. In terms of customer acceptance, that probably should be the hugest challenge, at least we, we hope so. We believe that we have developed a service that is competitive in terms of price, and, and it's very important. It's, it's in our company DNA. Um, Price is always very important for our customers. As an easy and in, um, intuitive interface with the user, simplicity is also very key for us. Integrates and integrates with other services, namely Continent Car Loyalty Scheme. We have more than 4 million Portuguese families using actively this loyalty card. And it's very important to be associated with all the service, with the, the ecosystem of service we offer in, to, our, to our customers. In, uh, in fact, we have already some data regarding the service acceptance. Uh, back from, well, we started the first location in last September. Now we have been, we have, we have been progressing with sending the service to other stores. Now we are already in 20 stores. We then accumulated 500,000 kilometers of electric mobility mileage and with roughly 4,000 kilometers charged on a daily basis. It's, in, it's just in the beginning, but uh, but uh, and considering that that uh, our country is, is uh, with very restricted mobility, uh, I believe that there are these are promising figures that uh, that encourages us to look further uh, to the future. Yes, very interesting perspective, and we must not forget that this was a very atypical year. So, in terms of mobility, we do have some some limitations so far. But uh, it was interesting to see how you make this segmentation for, for your customers. Uh, talking about customers and talking about parking lots and talking about the, 
opportunity when cars are actually parked. I, I will pass now to, to, to Annika um, to ask her, in your business, uh, parking and, and EV charging is usually uh, seen as, as a welcome courtesy, but suddenly customers may see this resource as something differentiating mainly in terms of cost and also, of course, in terms of environmental concern. Um, how do you think you can capitalize this, this investment that you, you need to have in, in, in the hotels? Do you think this, the opportunity of hotels providing uh, flexibility is something that could help you supporting this investment, Anika? Yeah, thank you, Luis, for this uh, question. And hello and good afternoon to everyone else. Um, yeah, so first of all, maybe to make this point clear, Kio uh, itself is not a hotel um, owner or provider, but a technology provider. So we are actually um, providing the software needed to have a standardized communication among all energy relevant devices and systems. But in Interconnect or in the Internet uh, Interconnect project, we are um, leading one of the German pilots, which is about uh, smart EV charging infrastructure in hotels. And as we already heard before, not only uh, supermarkets are getting more and more interesting because people are arriving anyways and they have to park and they have to charge uh, their car somehow, but also hotels are getting more and more uh, in the focus of developing smart EV infrastructure and uh, service concepts. So what we can tell from, from our perspective and from our experience is that um, right now, there, it's not a matter of fact that there is actually EV charging infrastructure in these kind of buildings, but there is a rising demand for it because not only the, the private people coming by, uh, by their own um, electric cars, but also the business uh, women and men are arriving by, by electric cars because there are more and more companies who are kind of transforming their company fleet for uh, EV or EV cars so uh, that there is kind of a pushing demand for the hotel operator to provide actually the infrastructure the guests are requiring. So then talking about capitalization of these change and of these um, yeah, new services is maybe also a matter of not owning or um, gaining a lot, but to avoid, and this in terms of opportunity costs and um, costs that might arise if you install um, EV infrastructure in your hotels without having a look on your actual power limitation, which is physically given by the, uh, by the fuse. So if you're just uh, installing these um, EV charging infrastructure with having a limited capacity of power and then all these EVs might charge at the same time, you're going to have a problem because the, your uh, fuse is going to break. And then also you're going to have high power peaks, which will as a, um, yeah, in the contract or in the, um, in the com, um, constellation with your energy supplier will upgrade you in a higher uh, tariff model or in a higher power contract and this is these are two factors that you want of course to avoid as a hotel operator so what you are doing and this is what we are um, yeah researching on and integrating in the in the German pilot is that we install a smart standardized um, EV infrastructure that takes all these um, how can I say, but years are at risk into consideration. And that is actually interacting with the whole building itself because there is also another uh, other big consumers within such buildings to see how much limit or how much power is available right now and, and how far can we charge at which, at which stage, in which order, uh, which vehicle, uh, electric vehicle. So there is a kind of logic, there is a standardized communication and there is also an interaction with the grid operator in the end. And then of course, having such a um, smart charging infrastructure is kind of an um, attractive approach to your customer because they know that they can for sure charge their EVs and they, they might also be um, attracted by, by your willing or your willingness to actually provide maybe green energy to, uh, to have a certain tariff where you can offer um, reduced power 
power prices once there is a share of a high share of renewable energies. So to have like all this attraction for the end user makes it pretty interesting to stay actually with your hotel. And then on the other side, avoiding all these costs that might come additionally once you um, upgrade in an hour in another tariff model with your energy supplier um, is actually something like some cost that you would avoid. Otherwise, you would have to pass it on to your guests, which you don't want, because then your overall uh, night or your overall stay at the hotel is going to increase. So yeah, this is what we're actually doing in the in the hotel pilot in Germany. And then, Thank of you. course, so, sorry, just a, a, a small yeah. ad. Uh, coming to providing flexibility, of course, I'm going to um, get a, go a little bit more deeper into this uh, in a bit, but um, providing flexibility, like seeing the, the the needs of the local grid and to react upon it is something that is, of course, uh, um, one model of the future, like the main model maybe to, to also get re remuneration and then maybe pass this again on to your hotel guest is kind of making the whole model quite interesting and attractive for all um, yeah, actors involved in this chain. Yes, and it's from the technological point of view, it can be used in hotels, but you can use in other buildings with other with other interests and perspectives, but the technology will be there. And that's very interesting. Thank you, Anika, for explaining your, your solution. Um, now we have seen we have seen different different players, different uh, technologies. We have these providers, but in the end we know. Uh, that users will want to be able to change and not commit to, 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 to a single provider. Josef, um, how, do, how do we move towards this interoperability? Is, is standardization the only way? Thanks again also from my side for the invitation. So before I would like to talk about the um, standardization or is it the only way? Um, I would raise uh, the question, what is interoperability? And that is the uh, starting point at all. Um, getting back 40 years, when I visited as a student foreign countries, I had a set of travel adapter with me um, because each country had an own individual 220 uh, volt plug. In the 19th, the next decade here, I, um, first time in my life, I used a mobile phone uh, talking and I could, I didn't do, but I uh, could have talked from Finland to Portugal with one technical solution. So this is one solution to ensure interoperability. If we come back to interoperability and what does it mean today, from my point of view, that different views and as for example, as an end user, I want to use my PV energy, and I want to use my own dishwasher with um, um, integrated flexibility. So that means using energy when it is available. But what I also want to do is I do not want to, uh, I want to replace my device even with another brand or with another, uh, from another manufacturer, but I do not want to change anything in addition means I, without changing my PV system, without changing my energy management service and so forth. So this is already uh, the requirement regarding interoperability. As a manufacturer and as a service provider, I would like to do the same. I would like to offer my device or my service, hopefully worldwide, without any modification. But then coming to a service, a service also could already defined in different ways. For example, if I, uh, and, and I can explain it with the pizza service, very easy to understand. If I order pizza, I get a pizza. That's easy, that's a service, yeah? But the ways I order pizza and the ways I get the pizza may already worry. So that means uh, worry. That means th we have different ways how to solve that issue. If you now come back to interoperability targets and how to approach them, and this is how we do it in interconnect, we have a clear process, yeah? 
before we start with that, uh, we focus on the use cases, the definitions of the province, understanding the people's need. So that means the end user has a different uh, view on the solution or on the requirement and the solution as for example, a DSO. We discover solutions, we map them on reference architectures, and then we elaborate and define step-by-step -step services. So that means what we do is step-by-step, -step, we elaborate ways to ensure interoperability. So now coming back to your question about um, what is the best way towards interoperability and if standardization is the only one. My, my answer is no, because I think it may not be complete, but I see um, um, three main pillars. The first one are the alliances. Um, when I started with BSH, I got a clear device from my boss, do not develop a pure white goods solution, users expect holistic solutions. So that means he told me very clearly, if you only focus on that, we are lost. Um, and at that time I started a survey, I went to the standardization bodies because I was familiar with these bodies, with Etsy, Senelec, IEC and so forth, but nobody had this on the radar screen. And not talking about other alliances, but I found the uh, EVAS initiative, and you already mentioned it, that I have been uh, the managing director of this e EVAS initiative as well. Uh, BSA joined in 2012, and this alliance has a clear target. We wanted to define a common language named SPINE, and, um, which allows all kinds of devices to communicate regarding energy management. So that means they can exchange information and so forth. Means white goods, eight, the heat pumps, water boilers, EV charging stations, PV systems, and so forth. And energy manager as well. So around 70 manufacturers are sitting together with manufacturers, service providers, and so forth. They are working on these holistic solutions, how that can fit together. Now we are approaching a next level. And this is, for example, for me, the next uh, pillar. These are international projects like Interconnect. And I really appreciate being part of that. Um, I think we have always worries, ways to achieve a solution. And not the only one, um, or not only one solution. Like, for example, we do it in EBUS. It would be the easiest way, but it's not the reality. Um, so. Interconnect puts it on another level. We are 50 partners with different solutions, with different targets um, and putting uh, together their solutions to achieve another level of interoperability, another level of data exchange, knowledge exchange and management capabilities. I think we, we come back to the ontology and to exchanging the information to other domains later on again. So this is what no single solution can afford, it's my view. The last is the third pillar. This is the international standardization. And of course, international standardization is a key element. It's the officially leg legitimated description of solutions, in my view. It can be used for regulations. No nothing else can be used for regulations. It's a must, but typically, and this is also a little bit uh, not, it's not a contrapoint, but it's 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 a uh, um, it's a yeah uh, yeah in situation yeah that it's focused on domains. For example, the TC fifty nine um, Senelec and ISC standardization body is only focusing on white goods. So that means, in a nutshell, we need all the three pillars from my point of view for the success because they have different foci, but they are complementing each other. Thanks. Thank you, Josef. Very interesting your vision because it's important for us to understand how we will manage to, to put all things working together. Uh, now I will make a question to, to, to Robin as, as representing the consumers. I think this is the, the most important, uh, let's say, player in, in this whole uh, operation. Uh, from your point of view, Robin, what are the main expectations of consumers regarding uh, electric mobility? And do you think they are prepared for this shift? 
Thank you very much, and, and thank you as well for the invitation. Um, lots of inter interesting stuff has been said already, and, uh, and it's great to see uh, so many experts in the field providing solutions and rightly identifying the, the barriers for, for consumers. I, I see we talked about um, the lack of knowledge, the lack of interoper interoperability for, for consumers, um, the restriction on, on competition, the need to manage the grid, uh, the imbalances of the grid, um, the need for simply more charging infra infrastructure on the, on the streets. And all of that, all of that is, is very, very relevant. Um, so I'll try to give the consumer point of view in all that, uh, trying to put maybe simple words on complicated terms sometimes. Um, I say that because there's a strong difference between two consumer groups the early adopters and the rest. Um, if you look on the internet, if you, took to, if you talk to an electric driver, um, you will see a big difference between him and someone who has been holding the same car for 20 years. Uh, early adopters are usually geeks, um, technology addicts that can really promote the use of the vehicles, but sometimes um, lack the feeling of other people in, 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 in terms of convenience and efficiency. Um, so that's a key point, and for me, that's the most important point. When we talk about all these complicated terms and all these technological issues, no one should be left behind. If you want to promote mass deployment of BEVs, um, there is a need to make it understandable for, for consumers. So that, that would be the main point. Going back to your question now, I think um, the cost component of electric, electric vehicles and electric mobility is key. For the moment, uh, electric vehicles have usually a higher upfront cost, even though the savings they provide for running cost is quite clear. But this is a strong barrier to entry of these, these vehicles, and this is quite important to, to, to mention here. Um, this is why with, with BEUC uh, and, and our consumer members and consumer organizations, um, we have uh, led a study on the total cost of ownership of electric cars. And I try to identify when and at which date these electric cars could really be the cheapest options for a first owner, which will drive the market, but also for second, second and, and, and third owner of the market, which, which is also very important as, when I say that no one should be left behind. The price impact, obviously, but also the convenience. And here I go back to what has been said already on, on charging, the, the need to revise uh, the AFID directive, the need to revise the uh, energy performance of building directive to, prov to, to, to make sure that every consumer that needs a charging point, be it at home because he has a garage, because he lives in an apartment where there is a common area for, for parking, or a consumer that has no choice but rely on, on charging on the street, it should be possible for any consumer to ask for it and to have it delivered. Of course, there is also the, the, the market uh, that should uh, play its role, but this is a key driver. The, the demand on demand rollout of, of charging station is, is, is probably uh, the second most uh, important element. A third point that, is, uh, that has been mentioned and I think is, is also quite relevant, and that goes back to the fact that no one should be left behind, um, is the lack of information. I usually take the example of my dad. He's 72 years old. Uh, he's a bright, strong, and uh, beautiful man. But still, if I talk to him about my job and how I try to promote battery electric vehicles, he sometimes, you know, try to look around and, and try to understand what I'm trying, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell him. So the information is key. When you go and buy an electric vehicle, and you hear that the uh, battery range is 357 WLTP, it might not make sense for many consumers. It comes with the habit and it comes with the fact that you have an EV, but this, the lack of information and the lack of uh, comparison between powertrains can, be uh, uh, can be quite a barrier for, for consumers. And there, the European Union, the European Union has a key tool, uh, which is the car labeling directive. But you know probably that this directive is 22 years old. It has been uh, published in 1999 at a time where uh, battery electric vehicles were not the most common things to find on the market. With all that being said, um, there's also obviously the, the help consumers can get by, 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 uh, if, you, if you want them to push uh, towards uh, electric mobility. 
This could be bonuses, uh, fiscal incentives, tax cuts, whatever. But it doesn't always mean that we need to put a lot of money. Um, I take a, a very simple example. If you put um, a purchase incentive for the first owner and the first buyer of a car, the sooner this first owner has the car, the sooner the second owner will have the car as well. And the, the benefits of a simple bonus tax cut can be spread out across the market and can really help every consumer that will eventually end up with the same one vehicle. So these are the four main elements that I think are, are quite important. Of course, everything that has been said is very re relevant, but uh, what I'm trying to do uh, as part of my daily job is translate uh, what experts say and, uh, and, and put that in front of consumers with uh, understandable words. Thank you, Robin. So yes, it's like we were discussing before, we need to increase the literacy of consumers in this domain. I think you raised very important points um, because this will only work if people understand the, the, the impact and the effects of their, their behavior. And that's something that at this moment we still haven't reached. Thank you very much. So for the, this last uh, first round of questions, I would ask Rolf, uh, after, after this first round of our discussion, what is your feeling uh, on the influence that owners of EVs have in the market? Do we truly have these user-centric services? Yeah, thank you for having me again on the panel. Um, I think, uh, first of all, yeah, um, I collected some, uh, some fruitful information and uh, I like the talk uh, and um, sort of impressed positively that there's a fresh mindset um, of looking into the market and giving an impetus to the market of electric vehicles. Uh, and I must say, you know, we, we are at the beginning of a journey. Um, and uh, in particular, um, the last comment from Robin, um, the, the way, you know, we look at the user is the most difficult one. Uh, looking across the different use cases, um, I think uh, what is the most sort of simple one or trivial one is if you want to charge your car, you need a parking space. So no, that's way simple. Uh, but then, you know, it starts already, you know, how do I reserve a parking space if I don't have a garage? <laughs> or uh, how do I find a parking space if I'm not at home and somehow traveling? So, um, so that, that shows, you know, that the user or the consumer or the driver of the car, he doesn't care much about technology or interoperability. What he sort of needs, he needs sort of a, a package of services. Um, convenience, the simpler the better. So looking at uh, um, the IKEA case is always nice. You know, you go shopping and then you have this nice amb ambience for dining and shopping, uh, leaving your kids. Uh, I have the case of presented by Sonai, you know, um, you go shopping and you have additional car service or parking service or charging service. Um, the case of the hotels is also very quite simple. I think, you know, there's a reason to get there and there's an added value service. So from that point of view, um, the, the demand side asking for packaged services or e-simple services is already a challenge for the supplier side. I think that is also quite quite prominent, um, prominently presented. We talked about an interoperability um, connecting different systems um, and then I said, you know, I'm a bit worried because we're still at the beginning of the journey, while at the same time there's an urgency, an urgency to act, to invest in infrastructure because the, the growth numbers of electric vehicles sold on the market, um, they are very dynamic and they are almost two-digit two, two growth. So meaning, you know, this we're running in that trap very quickly. And if we take money into our hands, you know, and uh, invest into deployment, uh, I'm afraid, you know, uh, I don't want to have a mushroom of different technologies over there. Um, we need sort of the, this, this urgency for common standards, for common architectures, for agreements uh, across different uh, uh, stakeholders from different uh, parts of the value chain, the grid operator or the manufacturer or some of the, the service providers who provide additional value. So here um, we need more of these sort of round tables like we hear. We need sort of a, um, an orchestration platform or a, 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 a dialogue platform where the next step is agreed and uh, the standards are promoted and validated. So that is a bit, you know, my, my concern on that side. 
But uh, at the first place, I'm quite positively impressed to bring the different stakeholders together and that we should continue on this line. Thank you very much, Rolf. So we have this first round of questions. Uh, you have all presented uh, your points of view in a very comprehensive way. Um, now we will have to be a little bit faster as we have more or less 10 minutes for this second round of questions. So I would like to ask you to have quicker answers around one minute for us to be able to be back on track and on, and on schedule. Um, my, my first question to, to, to Manuel, um, how, how do you see these uh, market-driven services along with, it, with the articulation between the grid and the EV charging service providers in motivating the adoption of EVs by end users? Hello, uh, again, Manuel here. Um, I think that I, I can build up on the, some of the points that uh, were made before. So uh, electric vehicles are more than an asset from, to go from A to B. Uh, it's a battery on wheels. And in the end, if we want to really that uh, the, the users adopt fully electric vehicles, you need to accompany with a vast software of energy services. And here, when we say energy services, it's tailored to consumer needs. Uh, what we believe is that these services uh, and the flexibility that comes from the EVs can be um, uh, useful for many types of uh, users at the same time. So it's an and story, it's not, not an or story. So you can have your EV to, to charge uh, your, your car whenever you want, or according to prices of electricity, or to use the PV that you have in your in your rooftop, or to provide flexibility to, to market players, I think. All this needs to, to, to do, uh, and we need to do it fast, and we need for that collaboration. So in the end, it's a collaboration between different actors along the value chain, uh, system operators, DSO, DSO, but also market players, including new ones like uh, the charging service providers. And you have different uh, examples of that in, 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 uh, in along the group. Huh? So, for instance, uh, uh, in, in Belgium, we have this uh, so-called Internet of Energy ecosystem where the, the TSO and DSOs are fostering the development of new services uh, in a, an agile approach, meaning test, learn, and then uh, reuse uh, with different cases of uh, EV. Uh, that's one point. But also, we need to update the market. I think that also means collaboration. Collaboration to address the market means that you need to see how to can you do it and how this can be done in a really easy way. And uh, I think that uh, today I cannot go more into details, but I would suggest that you stay tuned in the next few months uh, uh, before the summer break where we can communicate a bit more about that. Thank you very much, Manon. Uh, very briefly, Clara, uh, how do you see this? We we're talking about flexibility, DSOs, they tend to have this closed system for managing their infrastructure. What sort of interface will be required for this flexibility to be exploited? On a first step, it needs to adapt its, its tools, its tools for planning and its tools for operation, so that it can integrate actively this flexibility on, on the planning for the next day or for the next years. Um, on the second hand, the DSO has to be able to interact in a very flexible way with these new actors, uh, directly with the aggregators or through these local market flexibility platforms and also coordinate with the DSOs. And here, um, it needs a standardized approach for the services, for the data exchange and for the communication. Um, I would say that the TSO has, has, has progressed on these steps, but now it's time the DSO has an active voice on defining these new services, how it will coordinate with the TSO and with the other actors. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, Michelle, um, we're, we're talking, still connected with this point on, on flexibility, and you have presented V2X, or v 2 home vehicle to grid, vehicle to, to building. Um, we do not have a lot of time, we, we had a lot to discuss on this, but there is always a question that gives also some anxiety to people, uh, generically speaking, that is, if there is any sort of degradation on, on battery's lifetime, if we use these services regularly. Can you give us Volkswagen point of view on this topic? Michelle, I don't know if you heard my question. Yes, hello. <laughs> I had to, to find the right mute button, uh, unmute button. So, yeah, yeah thanks for the, for the question. Um, 
Yeah, uh, regarding how to how to interact. Um, so it's it's uh, it's something um, what you say is, is plug and uh, play. Um, we also have the functionality of plug and charge, um, where um, we, we, um, based on the ISO 11H standard, um, there's, a, there's a definition and there's also a secure uh, public infrastructure behind. So these are the the definitions and, and the requirements. Uh, what also is expected to to be um, uh, existing and to be built up over the whole chain of uh, of communication um, regarding um, the um, flexibility and the energy flow uh, and this i think is is, is very uh, important and that has to also be done on a, on a higher uh, system level uh, to to ensure also the grid uh, stability and and safety so this is also one one very important uh, point um, and what is also needed is um, to make it really easy for the customer that there is some um, um, regulation or some mechanism uh, behind where um, for example by dynamic costs for energy and and also combined with uh, flexible uh, grid costs that this is a system where it's automated uh, being um, in um, in, in correlation and so that the that intelligent like was also shown uh, earlier is being uh, also localized uh, which are then interacting in a way uh, that this uh, demand for energy and also the demand um, for the the power and the capability of the grid is being taken into consideration um, and also there's uh, another point which is also important and was mentioned in a in a um, uh, previous uh, speech that there must be data from the from the battery being given to this to this to the system um, but i would like to precise that a bit because the battery is not not the relevant part where the data has to come from the relevant part is where um, the energy demand is or, or how big the energy demand is and this what kind of power the car can be charged or discharged and we should be a bit more precise with such data requirements um, because it's very important to, to base uh, these uh, information exchanges on the real energy and power uh, data and not on any uh, other things like in the past was discussed about SOC and things like that. But that's, that's not really uh, appropriate. So we have really to, to take care that there the demand and the, the data being exchanged uh, is, is precisely and is also being free to uh, to exchange to be able to uh, support such uh, grid services. So I, I say with the battery, the second question about the battery um, um, degradation. Um, formerly, I was also responsible for the energy system development at, uh, at VW. And uh, in the year 2013, we have already started to um, um, yeah, prototyping on based on the on the eyes of the eight standard, uh, a car whose bidirectional charging, and uh, so we have also uh, took this as a as a testing. And uh, in the meantime, we know um, that the degradation of the battery due to the bidirectional charging is not a really big uh, big issue. Uh, this comes from from two aspects. One aspect is that. The charging power has uh, tremendously increased uh, of, the, of the electric cars. Uh, formerly, 50 kilowatt was really, uh, let's say, high power. But in the meantime, uh, everything below 150 uh, kilowatt charging power is is not really high power anymore, and it's not named as high power. It has to be beyond. And cars uh, in the range of um, uh, 350 kilowatt uh, power uh, uh, on the street and, and this is a uh, quite uh, immense impact on the design of the battery and on the other side the v2g uh, by the uh, functionality the battery functionality is not going such high so this is not really a big impact uh, to the battery but uh, what is an impact is and that's interesting that uh, due to the longer um, activity of the car compared to the lifetime of the whole uh, um, vehicle life um, we have to improve the, the electronics, so not the batteries anymore. Uh, a question regarding degradation, so that's that's uh, not an issue anymore. But the car has to be designed electronically about the uh, lifetime for such uh, functionality. Yes, thank you. Um, 
now, now moving again to, to, to Jose, um, those, those energy services uh, that, that you were mentioning, um, we know that currently there are some, some limitations in terms of regulation in, in Portugal. Um, can you elaborate very quickly how you foresee that we can overcome this, these limitations to provide these services? Uh, okay, thank you for the question. If, in fact, the regulatory framework is key in this subject. During the process of adapting our organization to carbon neutrality target, we have identified several hot topics that require our attention, and some of them were discussed in, the, in this meeting, and some of them are addressed with the interconnected project. Digitalization, storage, flexibility, artificial intelligence, um, renewable energy, renewable energy community efficiency. I believe all of this will become even more relevant in in future, and our current uh, regulation is not compatible with some with many of them. Um, probably we need a new regulatory framework. Uh, if if we we Sonai, but not only us. So if all country need uh, is serious, uh, willing to achieve the the ambitious targets we have in our companies, but also in the country. But coming back to your question, we the existing regulatory framework Sonai in order to fulfill the ambition to move towards carbon neutrality based on efficient digital integrated solutions, was forced to develop a private network of electric vehicle sh charging stations associated with a service to dedicate to, to electric vehicles. This private architecture allowed us to work on solutions that would not be possible otherwise. Uh, first of all, look at our buildings as a potential to, to renewable energy communities, uh, where the value is captured from optimization of the existing infrastructure and shared with customers, namely taking advantage of the local renewable in, uh, generation, taking advantage of the existing infrastructures and, and, and so the, uh, avoiding costs of dedicated infrastructures uh, and reducing the number of parties involved. Secondly, simplifying the communication with, with, with the customers, simplify the user experience, Establish very simple and intuitive price schemes, probably different from, from others that, that can, can be found. Every real time communication, client gets a notification with the invoice immediately after the service is, is provided with, with, with a mobile app where, where they have all the information uh, of, of uh, previous transactions. And, and it must be all integrated with, with other services. As I said before, loyalty card, uh, ecosystem is very important to be integrated with all this. All this approach, this integrated experience we want to offer to our customers would not be possible within the public network of EV charging stations. So that's why we, we have, we, we need to build this, this business model. Just to finalize, let me just uh, um, acknowledge the importance of the projects like Interconnect. Uh, to test these new concepts, these multi innovative and disruptive solutions, and promote the, the discussions like this one, even to help regulators and, uh, and the governance bodies to explore new pathways and evolve regulatory framework with ambitions to enable not us, but, but all country to achieve its targets. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, Annika. Um, when we talk about these uh, additional services, uh, do, do you think there is a, a strategy to, to the creation of these uh, additional services that will leverage the interests and those of, uh, for example, as you mentioned in, in, the, in the German pilot of the hotels? Uh, what, what, can, what can EV owners expect in terms of services from your point of view? Yeah, thank you, Luis. So one of the greatest potential we see is actually um, based in the introduction of dynamic or flexible tariffs so that you as a hotel owner, for example, can offer your guests um, the best price for their charging um, load. So you can plug in your, um, as a guest, you can plug in your car and then you stay there for the night. And there is an automated uh, communication and uh, price signal exchange between your wall box and um, the, the grid operator or the energy supplier. 
and the car is only charged when the prices are really low. So this would be a nice service that, that the hotels can offer actually to their customers. But then it requires, of course, a standardized and interoperable communication among all devices and elements involved. And it requires um, kind of innovative energy supplier and innovative grid operator who are actually offering these um, different or varying tariffs. And um, the price itself can be then based on the actual uh, electricity generation costs or on the grid stability and the current status of grid stability. And then it's also um, a way of remunerate the flexibility that is provided by shifting the, the point of charging the EV, for example, um, to another point when there is not enough energy right now in the grid. So this is like a pretty complex, but uh, quite um, yeah, potential use case. Then there are other use cases that we see coming, not only for hotels, but other um, settings as well, which is um, of course the, the self-optimization. If you have a PV installation on your roof, uh, no matter if it's a supermarket, a private uh, house or in hotel, you want of course to increase the share of um, of this green power as uh, as much as possible. And then you, of course, need, again, interoperable, technology-neutral um, communication among all devices and elements involved. And then there is a case of the energy forecast, which is uh, or might be interesting for aggregators and grid operators to see um, in terms of hotels where will be based on historical data and some of some sort of um, artificial intelligence where will be and when a power hotspot and how can we actually adjust our um, our load in the in the grid and then also as already mentioned the bi-directional or um, yeah the charging um, or the the feed of of the grid via the evs um, is a quite complex and interesting and promising case where um, where also the guests in the end if they provide their battery or their EV as a battery to serve the grid can be remunerated and kind of uh, benefit while they are sleeping in their hotel. So there are quite a lot of interesting business models. Of course, you have to define who's taking which role, who's the aggregator, who's the energy service provider, who's the grid operator. But once figured out, and this is what we're actually doing in uh, Interconnect, you can create kind of adaptable um, structures um, for future business models. And then, of course, this is also what, uh, for example, the EBUS initiative is doing, put all these use cases into standardized interoperable communication um, protocols so that actually no matter which manufacturer, no matter which uh, device can talk to each other and interact and yeah, benefit and gain in this chain. Thanks. Thank you very much, Annika. You, you also give the floor to my question to Josef. Uh, um, how, how do you see, Josef, this integration of these EV standards, namely uh, ISO 15101, with the ontologies creating the connectivity with these overlying services? Yeah, um, I think ISO uh, 15118 is one of the, the uh, sort of one of the uh, standards we need to support. So, in in general, my um, specific point is that it's a question of information exchange. So if we, for example, talk all the same language, that is the easiest way, but it's not realistic. If we use translator, it's a good idea, but it requests that um, we have a common interpretation of words and data. And here, that is my main bridge. That, that is the ontology, because the ontology is a doctrine of being the description of the meaning of data and their relations. So and this gives us the opportunity to exchange information on another level without having any specific um, dedicated language. So once again, how to um, bridge that? Um, um, for me, it's the use cases, the use case functions, the definition of all necessary information which need to be exchanged and then bring it into either a common language like we do it in EBAS or what we do in general is in all of the projects, we bring it into the SARAF ontology. So this is for me the main bridge and the technologies behind how to use the ontology are the main, uh, is the main bridge uh, for the information exchange. 
And this ontology as well gives us the opportunity not only to bridge the 151118 uh, and the um, OpenADR or whatever else is in charge as a DSO standard, it also allows us to share the information, the necessary information with domains like smart cities, smart environments, smart buildings, and so forth. So for me, uh, ontology definitely is the main bridge. Thank you, Josef. Um, one last question to, to, to Rolf, well, perhaps before Q&A, but I would like to hear your opinion about um, this adoption of, of interoperability. And, and we know that uh, the European Commission has been pushing a lot for this decarbonization and EV use. Um, what are, from your point of view, the, the main drivers? Do, do we need to update or to change them, considering the techno technological advances that we have seen so far? Um, I think I have three points to make. Um, uh, one thing is that we have seen standards for interoperability um, coming from the automotive domain, like the 15.11.8, or from the grid domain, like the 63.11.10. Uh, and, you know, and then you have standards from the emerging standards or de facto standards from the digital domain or semantics. Uh, so actually what we have to do, we have to work across domain. I think we have to make sure, you know, that um, the policy follows the innovation on the market. Uh, and then we have sort of a cost domain policy framework across digital energy and, and mobility. So that's why we work with interconnect, you know, shared responsibility across different um, commission services. So secondly, I think what we heard from the industrial stakeholders today, I think you have to think of extending your ecosystem, working across the, the value chain and the supply chain, you know, and diversifying the services. This requires communication, cooperation, but also in you know, the sort of common standards, open standards, um, open APIs, application interfaces, so where you allow third party contributions, embracing uh, smaller companies or startups or SMEs to contribute, eventually open source. I think we have to see, but basically the, the ecosystem is the driver also, you know, for many new consumer services as well. And third point I have to make is the I think we heard it many times about data, data and information exchange. Um, and you heard that uh, in the new Horizon Europe framework, we go beyond data uh, semantics, or we are beyond the language. So we talk about B2B data platforms, uh, data spaces um, uh, that supported um, as a goal by the commission. But also we also build on initiative for member states like Gaia X. Uh, and there we have this notion of data spaces um, for mobility, um, for energy, um, for, for manufacturing, um, and which goes beyond language, um, data format semantics, but also data access, um, data security, data sharing things, and the shared governance. Uh, and that is a bit of, you know, the big question we have at the moment. We see it as a driver, both from member states on the one hand and from commission policies on the other side. And we see also, um, we hope to have that to have an impetus on the market and on the acceleration of the EV penetration and deployment of EV charging infrastructure as well. Thank you, Rolf. It was a very important point because your drive will lead us in many of these uh, initiatives. I, I left the final question on purpose to, to, to Robin. After everything you heard in this panel, about the availability of uh, technology, all these business models, uh, energy awareness, interoperability. Um, what are the main challenges for people to really adopt uh, uh, EVs? And, and how do you think they would accept as valuable to, to provide this flexibility that we have been uh, discussing so far? Thank you. Um... It's true, my first intervention was more on, let's first put an EV in the hand of uh, consumers. And I, I, I think I can repeat it easily. It's quite the first thing to say. Um, now, of course, um, the flexibility a, a battery electric vehicle can offer is enormous and can really change the way we consume as it already changes the way we drive. Um, notably, 
if if I relate to the the the, the, the Green Deal, it is commonly accepted that an EV driver usually drive less, drive uh, less fast as well, and uses his car as a real mobility tool rather than just a convenience, uh, a four-wheel cart that he can use everywhere. Um, but again, the conditions are, I would say, twofold. Um, I've already expressed the, the green transition, so the the consumers must see the real potential and the real financial incentives, benefits that he could get from this flexibility. And the second, uh, Rolf just mentioned it, is the data governance. What are stakeholders going to do with the data uh, I provide? Because um, some consumers might still be uh, afraid or scared to share so many data with consumers, with uh, stakeholders, be it the way they drive, be it the amount of energy they use, um, be it uh, when they charge. Uh, there are lots of reasons of concerns for, for consumers, not only for their own personal uh, behavior, for their own personal convenience, but also in terms of uh, uh, market uh, uh, driving, on, on, on how to drive the market. We have seen many scenarios and many, and history teach us, teaches us that um, competition is not always a guarantee to a fair competition. Enabling this competition is not always a guarantee. So um, I think the, 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 the Commission's plan on the European mobility data, data space should really settle the scene and say, okay, let's put this consumers at the center of its data and let, let him share it with who he wants the in the most efficient way and providing safeguards in how this data is shared is probably the, the, the second most important stuff to do uh, to make sure consumers take on are really uh, on board of this transition thank you thank you very much uh for your for your point um before closing um the session um you did mention something important um, that is about data, and data takes us to, to security, and I will, we are somehow limited in time, but I would like to, to address one of the questions that we have here in the Q&A, um, where it's mentioned that EV manufacturers and EV charging station manufacturers are building aggregation points which are controlled via the public internet. There is no minimum cybersecurity requirements for those kind of aggregation. Partially, they can be controlled from outside of Europe. Is it not a potential threat to the European grid stability? Um, this is a provocative question, but somehow important. I'm not sure, Rolf, do you think you can give us your point of view uh, on this question? Um... I think, yes, normally, of course, it's the, the most easiest way um, is to do it over the public inter internet. Uh, but certainly, um, as I said, um, if uh, a security encryption sh should be part of a data strategy and to give a short answer. I think that is, you know, um, if you, you're doing that alone, you develop your communication tools or your, your setup um, of the services, you go to the most simple one. But I think nowadays, as I said, if you work in the ecosystem, uh, you're able to to design um, the, the services from scratch, you know, and that not only you can use it, but they are scalable, um, they are secure, and they are interoperable. Uh, and that will, will avoid these, 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 uh, these threats on the one hand, but also, you know, uh, give a bit more on uh, um, trust um, in, in, in the system. Thank you, Rolf. We, we also had a contribution from, from Michel. He, he did mention something important, that is uh, the standards. Uh, that's why they are mandatory. Um, and so he, he offers the example of the public key infrastructure also for the energy and green market as something that is necessary. Um, I would like to thank everyone uh, for your contribution. I feel that we could be in this discussion for much longer time than we had. Uh, but now we have to pass uh, the word for, for the next session. Um, and so thank you very much for your contribution. And I hope everyone has enjoyed the discussion and that has seen all these questions answered. Thank you.
Thank you very much again to all the participants in the round table. Thank you, Luis, for moderating this discussion. We will now have our last presentation, and for that we would like to thank and welcome the Portuguese Minister of Environment and Energy Transition, João Pedro Matos Fernandes. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, your invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you, uh, to talk with you a little bit about what, uh, what which are uh, the Portuguese commitments uh, and what uh, we are doing uh, on the electrical mobility. In 2016, Portugal was the first country in the world to say we are going to be carbon neutral by 2050. And this is not it was not just a sentence, uh, because on it, we developed a roadmap to achieve this goal. Carbon neutrality in Portugal requires more than 85% of GHG emission reduction when compared to 2005. A carbon sequestration capacity in the range of 13 million tons, we have nowadays about 9 million tons. And all sectors are invited to contribute to the emission reduction. Nevertheless, the energy system is expected to achieve the greatest contribution, with particular focus on electricity generation and transport. The roadmap studied uh, several scenarios. And achieving carbon neutrality in 2050 implies the total decarbonization of the electricity generation system and urban mobility as well as deep changes in the way we use energy and resources. The electrification of the economy is one of the main vectors of decarbonization. By 2050, more than 65% of final, final energy consumption will be electricity, but this is a trend that starts in the current decades, so before 2030. Currently, electricity accounts for only about 26% of final energy consumption, and we have to increase it a lot. The next decade is critical to ensure alignment with the carbon neutrality trajectory. With that in mind, we have reinforced our ambition for 2030 under the National Energy and Climate Plan. By setting new emission reduction targets up to 55%, and the transport sector should reduce by 40% its uh, GHG emissions. By setting a 35% target for energy efficiency, and by setting a target of 47% for renewable energy in gross final energy demand. By 2030, Portugal aims at one third of urban mobility needs to be met by electric mobility, which is especially important in road passenger transport and urban freight transport. Driving the change to a more sustainable mobility encompasses a significant electric mobility dimension. In later years, we significantly increase the share of renewables, both in the supply side and in the end use. We already have 59% renewable share in electricity generation. And with such, scare of renew such share of renewables in electricity makes the electrification of mobility even more sustainable. Greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector have increased over time and now account for a quarter of the EU total. The biggest challenge facing the transport sector is to reduce its emissions and become more sustainable. We must change the existing paradigm from incremental change to fundamental transformation. Thus, by changing the transport modes from fossil fuel to emission-free modes, uh, we believe that we are fundamentally transforming transportation. The key policies adopted to achieve these goals have been developed account along three pillars public transport, active mobility, and zero emission vehicles. Of paramount importance are the investments in public transport, whether in fare reduction, fleet renovation with zero emissions vehicles, or network coverage improvements. 
Zero emission vehicles have been more relevant for the Portuguese public policies since 2010, with the launching of the EV charging pilot network. In those days, it was important to set up a public charging network before an upfront demand for it, since the EV fleet was still reduced. To put into operation the EV chargers pilot network was really challenged in 2015. It required to establish regulation splitting the charging point operator, the supplier of electricity for electric mobility, and the communications network system that would interconnect all these parties between them and with the EV user. To manage this network, as well as information and financial flows, a new entity was created acting in the regulated market as Electric Mobility Management Body, and so Mobi E was born. The Portuguese model for the public network is really simple and intuitive for the user. Just as an ATM network, the Mobi E network is user centered. This means that the user just needs to establish a contract with one electricity supplier to have access to all sharing points in the public network. From the very start, the vision for the Portuguese EV charging public network is to be universal, meaning that every user must be able to charge anywhere with the same card with the same electricity supplier contract. If the charging point is located in a publicly accessible space, public or privately owned, it is mandatory by law that the charging point must be connected to the public network, the, the so-called Mobi E. Thus, all publicly accessible points must be connected to Mobi E, which then acts as a roaming platform exchanging information between the EV user, the electricity supplier and the charging point operator. It is very important for the EV user to rely on the public charging network so that electricity mobility becomes the mainstream mobility. The initial public network had just about 400 EV chargers and it has grown since then until the current 2,154 normal charging points and 647 fast charging points. Those are the figures on the last February. In 2020, it ran more than 840,000 chargers for a Portuguese fleet of about 62,000 electric passengers and light duty vehicles. The geographic coverage is very important to provide confidence to the EV user and to show off the network presence. Today, more than 92% of the Portuguese municipalities have at least one public network charging point, and it's expected to have 100% coverage by the end of this year. In 2020, the Portuguese public EV charging network has been totally franchised, giving operators an incentive to invest in their own charging stations. The Portuguese state is now investing in the platform that manages the network. And the public network expansion is now a direct consequence of the business case that each operator could set up, having in mind that their customer can charge everywhere in Portugal. The Portuguese government is covering market gaps and supporting the investment in certain regions of the country where difficult business cases could prevent private operators to invest in a first approach. The objective is to divest and franchise as soon as possible. That is the case with the recent investment of 3 million euros to implement 10 charging hubs and 12 ultra-fast charging points in municipalities without disability in the interior of Portugal mainly, trying to cover a market gap and allowing public charging networks assess on those locations. This way, Portugal is looking forward to expanding the electric mobility as a critical contribution to remove as fast as possible the internal combustion engines from the streets and roads of our countries and thus to decarbonize mobility. A granting scheme to purchase EV is being implemented since 2017 by the Environmental Fund. In 2021, the subsidies amount up to 4 million euros and focus on three key areas of intervention light-duty passengers' vehicles, 
urban logistic vehicles and active mobility vehicles, I mean bicycles. Since 2016, we run a specific program for converting public fleets to electric, which amounts to more than 20 million euros and has helped the introduction of more than 100 electric vehicles in such fleets. More recently, and aiming towards increasing the diversification of solutions available to provide electrical mobility, Portugal introduced the national strategy for hydrogen. Hydrogen, mainly green hydrogen, has the potential to be used by heavy duty passengers and freight vehicles, supporting the energy transition on this specific segment where the introduction of electric vehicles has been slower. For the coming decade, we will envision that economic recovery fund should be streamlined to provide a highly valuable opportunity to proceed on our ambitious energy and climate 2030 targets by front-loading the investments and reforms proposed in the Portuguese NEPC, so the plan, the national plan for climate. We believe that the mobility sector will be the one whose transformation will be more disruptive despite increased demand for mobility in all modes. As we saw last September 2020, for the first time in European history, registration of electric vehicles overtook diesel vehicles. Portugal is currently the fourth country in Europe with the highest electric vehicles shares on sales. In conclusion, Portugal is not alone in this quest. The European Commission presented the Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy together with an action plan of 82 initiatives that will guide our work for the next four years. This strategy lays the foundation for how the EU transport systems can achieve its green and digital transformation and become more resilient to future crises. As outlined by the European Green Deal, the result will be a 90% cut in emissions by 2050, delivered by a smart, competitive, safe, accessible and affordable transport system. The future of mobility is definitely electric, connected and cleaner. And we all need to move fast to achieve the ambitious goals of transport decarbonization by 2030 and the carbon neutrality by 2050. For a better Earth, for our people and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech and for supporting us in, um, in this event. Uh, sir, and now we will uh, close our session with uh, uh, Luis Seca uh, directly from our uh, laboratory of smart grids and electrical vehicles at Inesc Tech. Thank you. Um, so it's not to, to, to wrap up the session. Um, I think we had a rich discussion and very interesting presentations. It was clear that electrification of transportation is key for decarbonization. It was also clear that we have the technology, we are aware of the problems and also aware of the opportunities that are coming. Uh, in Interconnect, we will move one step further in this harmonization and regulation of this coming shift in the energy system because in the end, uh, electric mobility will have an impact not only in transportation, but only in the electrical system. So I would like to thank everyone's presence and contribution, particularly to Mr. Minister Matt Fernandes and the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union in supporting our initiative. Be safe and stay interconnected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. We will now close the session uh, and uh, let us just tell you that uh, the session has been recorded and will be sent to every participant here today. Thank you very much again. Stay safe. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.